So these minds of ours are always acting. They're always committing actions. And so we need to always be trying to, to have effort. Sometimes our minds are very unsettled and we won't want to put in any effort at those times. And sometimes we're feeling, we're feeling down, we're feeling sad, and we won't want to, to put any effort in them. But we have to go against these feelings, we have to oppose them. Because in this path of practice, we have to take it that if we're lazy, then we'll do it. And if we're feeling energetic, then we'll do it as well. So we have to oppose the feelings in our hearts to go against them. At the beginning, it's like this. There can be many different feelings. And so that's why we need to undertake this training. But when we practice frequently, then our hearts will gain energy. At the beginning, it's difficult, it's arduous. And why is that? It's because our minds are used to chasing after all of the emotions that they feel between feeling angry, fearful, you know, whatever it is, our minds are used to just running after them. But we need to oppose that. We can't just let them go off like that. And so Tanajan was saying that there was a time when he was a younger monk, that he was staying in a charnel ground, in a, a forest that they use for cremations and just leaving bodies to decay. And uh, he was there because that's what he had heard Ajahn Chah did. And that's how Ajahn Chah taught, that we should fight with our fear. And he was very, very scared staying in that channel ground. So he tried to stay with the meditation mantra Buddha all the time. But if the Buddha, the word Buddha uh, slipped away, then the fear would come back very strong and his body would get all tensed up and he would start shaking. He was so afraid that it felt like his mindfulness was just going to leave as though he was going to lose his senses and maybe start going crazy. Because the fear was just that intense. So he was doing walking meditation and feeling this this uh, terror and f feeling like he wouldn't be able to take it anymore. And so he went back to his umbrella tent that he was staying in and uh, sat in meditation and brought his mind together and collected it inwards into a state of samadhi. And then both his body and mind felt very buoyant and light. So from having this really scattered and uh, fearful and chaotic mind, uh, he managed to bring it into a state of stillness, of peace, and the mind felt very empty. He sat for an hour like this, and then after that went back to the place where he was doing walking meditation. And he could see the difference that Previously, when he was doing walking there, there was this terror coming up. But now, going back after sitting, it was very peaceful. So before, the mindfulness just wasn't there. And then with mindfulness not being there, then there wasn't any wisdom that arose. There was just a sense of self, you know, taking body and mind as me and mine and a great fear of death. But then when the mind was able to, to settle down into peace, wisdom could arise and perceive into truth, to see that everyone is like this, that once we're born, we have to meet with old age, sickness and death. He then got a stick and cleared away uh, some of the bones from the people that they had cremated there previously 
and had a look at them. And you could see the bones there in the moonlight. And standing there, looking at these bones, uh, there was a line from a poem that came up into his mind. And uh, this line is that the bones, bones are the flowers of the Buddha. So in contemplating like this, then, then wisdom could arise. And there was a feeling of, of fullness, of, of joy in the heart. And this all came from the training of the mind. And so if we, if we don't fight with our fear, and we don't, um, we don't try and go against it and meet up with it, if we just run away from it, then in the future we're going to have problems when we do have to meet with fearful things. So we have to learn to, to oppose our emotions, to go against them, to not give in to them. And he, uh, Tanajan had the same experience that uh, he wanted to just give in to his fear. That when he was uh, a new monk, um, just one rains retreat, just one year as a monk, during the Vasa, the rains retreat period, he would think about going to practice in the channel ground that was at Wat Nombapong, Ajahn Chah's monastery. And he'd heard stories of monks, uh, these uh, forest monks going and practicing in channel grounds. So he thought he would try doing the same. So every morning he would think uh, that in the evening he would go and sit meditation, do walking meditation in the channel ground. But then when evening came, it feel, felt like uh, the whole environment, the whole feeling had just changed and he wouldn't be able to make himself go. And so it was a long time like this, thinking in the morning of going and then in the evening not going until the rains retreat ended. And then he really put a lot of effort into trying to oppose this fear and recollected that that he's a, a forest monk. And as forest monks, we should contemplate death instead of just being terrified of death. So eventually he was able to gather up enough courage to be able to, to go into the Chalma ground at night and do walking meditation there. And it was a good opportunity having that that channel ground there and um, occasionally doing cremations in it because it was uh, you could contemplate into the nature of life and death and into these bodies sometimes there'd be burning a corpse and the hand would fall off and then a, a dog would come and eat it <clears throat> and so you could get a, a strong sense of dispassion for the body and seeing that so why do we have to burn bodies like this? Or why do we have to bury them? Well, it's because we need to kill the bacteria that uh, uh, swarm as these bodies. Well, now we can see that many people are dying from uh, this epidemic that's spreading around. And when the bodies, human bodies die from this, then no one wants them. We have to hurry to take them to, to get burnt or we bury them in the ground and no one wants them. So if we have a virus and there's no medication, then these bodies uh, become worthless. But the same body is something that we, when they're alive, we attach to them and we love them. We cling strongly to them as being me as being something that belongs to me. But in time, when the breath of our body runs out, when the fire element disperses, then the, all of the elements start to form, fall apart. When the warmth of the body leaves, then it'll start to decay and break apart. And we'll be able to see clearly into the a super nature that these bodies really aren't beautiful. They're just full of bacteria. And so 
Venerable Kila Mananda, he listened to the Dharma that Venerable Ananda taught him. To contemplate this body and to see clearly into its nature. And he was able to do this. He was able to contemplate in this way. So we should try doing the same as what he did. Try to investigate these bodies and to see that they're full of pain because they have to get hungry, they have to uh, become thirsty and they have to get sick. And when they become ill, then there's a lot of difficulty and suffering that's contained in our bodies. And just before the period of death, then there can be great pain and anguish there. So we need to try and practice so we can find a way out of the suffering. Sometimes we're very afraid, but that uh, fear we have is just because we don't see into this nature of death. So we should, um, one thing we could do is to go into a Chanagarana and practice there, but even if we don't have that opportunity, we can still investigate these bodies just the same, because really our bodies are a channel ground. And if we think from since the time we were born, how many animals we've put into this body, you know, when, when we eat, just how many, how much flesh, how much blood we've consumed. So we can see that there are, th these bodies are channel grounds. Or if some people are vegetarian, we can contemplate the body in terms of its elements and see that it's just earth, water, fire, and air. When these elements separate out, then the nature of anatta, of not-self, can be seen very clearly. So this is where the practice is. The practice is right here. We don't have to go anywhere else. And the practice is making our minds peaceful, bringing them into stillness, and then using that, the energy and the stability of that to investigate uh, physicality, to see that it doesn't last, that it changes, that it's not beautiful. When we see this, then there'll be happiness that arises and we'll be able to see into the nature of conventions and our hearts then will be liberated and we'll experience emptiness. So we'll have to, if, if we practice correctly, then at some point in time, we'll have to experience this. There was one time when Tanajan went to see an autopsy in the hospital. And as they were cutting open the body, there was a, a deep sense of dispassion that arose. You could see, and, and also a, a feeling of peace a very uh, profound peace. As you could see that um, this person who they were, they were cutting up, um, they still had food in the stomach. And they probably had no idea in the morning that they wouldn't even have time to digest their food. They were going out doing exercise in the morning and, um, and then a bomb exploded and this, this man died. So looking at this corpse uh, being dissected, then the mind uh, grew very still and peaceful and there wasn't any, any thinking or um, proliferation that was going on. And this is the point of all of the meditation objects that we take up is to bring our minds into stillness. Whether we have our eyes open or whether they're closed, we can still use our meditation objects to experience peace, to contemplate until peace arises. And so when they'd finished with the autopsy and they started to put the uniform back onto to this body, then Tanajan's mind started proliferating. 
started thinking again. And the thought that, ah, so this is a policeman, came up into his mind. And this was conventions, the mind starting to create conventions again. That was happening. But there was enough presence of mind to know what was happening and to be very clear about that process. And so as that thought then arose of, ah, so this is a policeman, there was knowledge that arose along with it that really this, this isn't a policeman, that there, there's no such thing, that there's no, there's no being there, there's no self, there's no me, there's no other in that. And this was true knowledge that arose. The knowledge that comes up through wisdom, through what we call Bhavana uh, Mayapanya. So this is the knowledge that comes up from practice, and it's not just thought. Because if we thought, if, if we just think, then there'll also be a lot of doubts that come up. But when we practice and we gain knowledge from the practice, then that will be a cause for uh, all the doubts to be relieved. The mind then was very bright. His mind was very bright and light, and it lasted for a very long time as well. And you could see all of the people walking about as though they were just dolls or robots. They were walking here and there, whether they were men or women. But they just looked like robots. You could see that the mind was one thing, and these bodies were something entirely different, and could separate them out. So that's what happens when the Dhamma arises in the heart. You can see that there really is no self there, that there's no, there's no person. And these are all just conventions. And when the mind moves beyond conventions, then it'll be able to experience liberation. It'll be freed from the sense of self and freed from suffering. And so as we practice like this, then we'll experience the fruits of the practice in this way. And that comes from us training our minds as we are doing. So even if we feel lazy to do sitting meditation, to walk in meditation, we should still try to, to make ourselves do it. As we chant, then we are very intent with the chanting and try to have our minds paying attention there. As we practice like this and we carry on going with it, day in, day out, we carry on training ourselves, then one day we'll have to experience the fruits of that and our minds will have to become peaceful and calm. We'll meet with the point where the mind isn't going off into liking or disliking and it's just there in the center. And this is the path of practice, to keep the mind there in the center. This is the path to Nibbana, seeing all physical things and non-physical things, the uh, physicality and mentality, as being anicca, dukkha, anatta. This is the path to purity and to Nibbana. So if we can contemplate and see into the emptiness of the body, to see that uh, it's not self, that it's anatta, and we do this often, then we'll see the fruits of that practice for ourselves. So if we like to contemplate into emptiness, into anatta, then we should do that practice often. Or if we like to think about and contemplate into impermanence and uh, the instability of phenomena, then we should use that contemplation often. And we can bring up that recollection very frequently and tell ourselves all the time that this is not sure, it's not certain. No matter what moods we feel, they're not sure, they're not certain. When we see into the uncertain nature of phenomena, then our minds will be there in the middle. They'll be centered. 
And this mind that is poised, centered, that is the path to Nibbana and the path to Dhamma, the path to purity. So we take up the training of the mind in this way. And even if we have doubts, then we should try to, to persist and carry on with it. But don't, also don't put too much pressure on yourself. No, don't, don't force yourself too much, but also don't take it too slowly. When we practice like this, then we'll gain understanding. And we'll see that really this path of practice, it's not all that difficult. And it's something that is within the, our capabilities of doing. Whenever any mood comes up, we just contemplate that this is not sure, it's not stable, it doesn't last. We always have our mindfulness there following up on our minds, allowing wisdom to arise all the time. We have our mindfulness there and we try and not let it go. We don't just allow the mind to run after the different things that it thinks and feels, but we try to always take care of our minds. If we don't take care of our minds, then it's just like our minds are destitute or they're homeless. They've got no one there looking after them. So it's important that we keep our mindfulness and we always try and look after our hearts, try and keep them in a good state. And this is the path of practice to seeing the Dhamma. So we try and have that intention and devotion to the practice to, to carry on with the training. We see that the Buddha had great compassion and that he went through so many difficulties to realize the Dhamma. And he also had extraordinary wisdom to be able to defeat ignorance, to be able to find the way out of the cycle of birth and death, and to be able to teach us all how to do that as well, how to gain freedom from suffering. Because if we don't try and practice in this way, then we'll have to spin around in the cycle of birth and death always. It's okay for us now, being humans. You know, there isn't too much suffering involved with that. But if we make our way into the animal world, then it's very difficult. It's a lot of suffering. So we need to try to, to fight with the different moods and emotions that we have that pull us away from the practice and try to use this opportunity that we have in this life as best we can to really maintain our mindfulness as much as we can, to do a lot of practice, to chant a lot and to keep our minds uh, intent on the chanting until we can experience peace, until we can contemplate in a way that allows our minds to feel very spacious and peaceful. We can maybe try listening to the Dharma <clears throat> first and then sitting in meditation. And this can help us to gain understanding through our meditation practice, to see into the nature of conventions and to then experience the liberation that comes from that. So try to be wholehearted in this practice and to putting in efforts to keeping our mindfulness with us all the time and keeping that smooth and even. And one day we'll have to meet with success.